How do you manage fluid and electrolytes? How do you manage hyponatremia? What electrolytes are important? In this surgery tutorial, we're gonna cover all of those questions and everything else about fluid and electrolytes, so let's do it. Welcome back, my name is Dr. Eric Pearson and I'm so pumped that you're joining us for another video. I hope that you've enjoyed the first few on the metabolic response to injury, the surgical nutrition videos. If you haven't actually seen those yet, go ahead, hit the cards up here. If you haven't had a chance to subscribe, go ahead, subscribe, then you'll know when all these videos are coming out. Um, you know, in this COVID-19 pandemic crisis, I figured I love educating and that this was one of the best ways to scale surgical education. I've always wanted a resource that I could go to and quickly get some knowledge that I could harness between cases or on the walk-in from the car. So I'm making these videos 15 to 25 minutes covering the core subjects of surgery. So whether you're a medical student or you're a resident, a fellow, a surgeon, resitting their board exams, I'm hoping getting through these basics is really providing you with a good foundation in general surgery. So in this surgery tutorial on fluid and electrolytes, we're gonna cover that chapter that I'm sure you've skipped a few times. I probably didn't read it until I was a third year resident going into the ICU again, and I knew that I just had to know all of these values and why they were important. So today we're gonna to go over the fluid and electrolyte, the ob obligatory losses and the needs. We're also gonna go through hyperhyponatremia, hyperhypokalemia, the calciums, mag, FOS, all those really important values. So when you get that BMP, you're gonna know how to interpret it, you're gonna have a good reason for getting it, and to know what you're gonna do with the results. So, without further ado, let's jump into the video for today. As always, we wanna review the question that we ended with, and so on part three, surgical nutrition, if you didn't see that, go ahead, hit the card up there. Part three was on TPN indications and design, where we covered all of TPN and how to order it, design a basic uh, formula for TPN, which is, you should know that for your board exams how to at least get started, and also for taking care of patients and understanding all those nutritional aspects of the ICU care and even in the post-op care on your patients on the floor. So well, let's go into that question. So this is a 25-year-old, 85-kilo male admitted to the surgical ICU with an open abdomen, damage control surgery. Uh, he sustained a solid organ injury, avulsed multiple segments of his small bowel, mesentery required resection. He's now in multiple discontinuity. And um, what I asked was to write up a basic TPN solution for this patient. And what are some of the major considerations of his ongoing TPN needs? All right, so to answer this question, definitely check out that video. We're not gonna go to all the numbers here, but the first thing I want you to think about is does this guy have a good indication for TPN? Well, yeah, bowel and discontinuity, you know he's gonna be NPO for at least five to seven days. We knew that he was previously healthy, but still, he's gonna definitely hit that threshold for needing parenteral nutrition. Uh, secondly, think in terms of fluid and energy. So when we're designing TPN, we think of fluid first. So in this guy, we're gonna do the four, two, one rule. That's gonna give us our fluid needs. I'll let you calculate on your own, okay? Um, and then when we go in the energy, we're gonna say, okay, critically injured guy, we're gonna probably previously healthy, 30 kilocals per kilogram, and then once we determine that total caloric need, we're gonna need to give about 60% of carbohydrates, and we'll do that by calculating our percentage dextro dextrose solution. We we'll wanna give 30% lipid, we're gonna wanna increase the amount of those omega-3, of those anti-inflammatory fatty acids in the lipid component. Uh, and then when we go to the protein, we're gonna wanna be about one to 1.5 grams per kilo. Now when you do all those calculations, you'll have a good, simple design of your TPN. To that, we're gonna maybe add some um, daily vitamins. We're gonna wanna add your micronutrients. We might wanna add an edge to antagonist might want to add some insulin if he's had hyperglycemia. And then we're going to want to have a really good understanding of how we follow this going forward. And that gets to the second question. So what are the major considerations? One major consideration is 
This guy has an open abdomen. He's in discontinuity. He has a vac that's going to be draining fluid. He has probably a nasogastric tube, which is draining fluid. So we're going to want to really closely monitor what his blood pressure, heart rate, urine output are, and how his you know, overall fluid status is to determine those fluid needs. You know, secondly, is as we get further along in the ICU course, we're gonna probably wanna do some indirect calorimetry. We're gonna wanna calculate his RQ, find out are we over or under feeding him? Is he gonna need more calories per kilo? Is he gonna be in one of those critically injured patients that's up at 35 or 40 kilocals per kilogram per day? And we're not gonna know that unless we do an RQ. So if you need to go back to that video, again, go ahead, hit that card. You'll get back up into the fluid and energy where we talked about how to calculate the RQ, what it means, why when you burn glucose, it's a RQ equals one, and while you burn a fat like palmitate, the RQ is 0.7. So if you go watch that video, you'll totally crush it. And uh, now let's get on to the talk, fluid and electrolytes, let's do it. All right, so fluid and electrolytes. This is what I like to refer to as the basics of the basics. This is something that you do in every single patient every single day. So you gotta know what's going on with the fluid and electrolytes. So first, we're gonna talk about the body's fluid and its compartments. Second, you're gonna be confident in understanding all of the electrolyte disturbances. Hyponatremia, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia. We're gonna go through magnesium, phosphate, well, acid base. We're gonna get it all in. And third is you're gonna to wanna to know how to fix these electrolyte disturbances. And we're gonna focus on a couple. You know, sodium is one of those really difficult ones where you have hyperosmolar and hypoosmolar, hypo hyponatremia. And we're gonna get through all that. So I, I hope you join with me the whole time. And uh, towards the end, we're gonna put it all together. And I think you're really gonna get a lot out of this video. All right, like every video, we like to ask why. So why is important to learn this? It's important to learn this because it's something we do every day. You can't just click that D5 half NS with 28K at 75 milliliters per hour and just hope it's gonna work. You gotta know that when you get that BMP and all of a sudden, the sodium is 125 or the sodium is 117 and that elderly patient who had a fall and came in with a TBI, how are you gonna replace that? How are you gonna fix it? You know, when you have that patient who comes in with a potassium of six, what does that mean? How are you gonna fix that? When you have the patient who's hypocalcemic, what does that mean? Hypomagnesemic or low phosphate, what does that mean? How are you gonna fix it? So understanding the fluid compartments of the body and the fluid that you give, how that's distributed, as well as the electrolytes or something as surgeons that we need to know how to do every day. You can't just look and hope that the number turns red in Epic or whatever uh, electronic health record you use. You gotta know the numbers, you gotta know the why. All right, so let's go. For the references, the major reference for today is Norton's surgery. I think that for the basic chapters, Norton's is probably the best reference. So if you're gonna get a textbook and you're gonna use it as a reference to study the basic science of these core surgical medical knowledge topics, I think Norton's is the way to go. When we get into the clinical topics, I'll be referring to Sabastin's, I'll be referring to Top Knife, I'll be referring to a few of the other textbooks um, and reference books, things, the ones that I love. And, um, but for this one, go back to Norton's. These chapters, they're dense, but they really have what you need to know to be confident in understanding these basic building blocks of surgery. All right, to kick it off, we're gonna look at the compartments of the body. Now this is important. Why is it important? It's important because, as we'll talk about, the fluid that you give, whether it's D5 water or normal saline or 5% albumin or blood, that fluid that we give distributes to different compartments. And so if you don't know what compart the compartments are, what percentage they are in the body and where that fluid goes, you're not gonna know what to do in what situation. So you have that patient who comes in with one liter blood loss, right? How do you replace one liter and how much volume do you have to give? All right, well, you're gonna know. In 10 minutes from now, you're gonna know that answer. Okay, so when we look at 
total body water. It can change with age and it can also change with gender, but look at it as about 60% of total body weight is water. Now that changes a little bit. So when we look at newborns, so I take care of newborns as a pediatric surgeon, and about 75 to 80% of their body weight is water, and this decreases with age. Once you get to one year old, it's about 65% of weight is totally body water, and then once you get up to adulthood or late adolescence, it's 60% of total body weight is water for males, and then about 50% for females. When we take that 60%, that 60% of total body water is divided into two basic compartments. You have your intracellular, which is the majority, that's gonna be 40 of the 60, okay? And then you have the extracellular, which is 20%. And so those two together make up total body water, 40% for intracellular, 20% for extracellular. And each of those compartments have different uh, electrolyte distributions. When we look at the intracellular component, so that's the majority, the major cation is potassium. Now this is the opposite when you get to the extracellular compartment, which makes up that 20%. And that's where the major extracellular cation is sodium and the potassium level is very low. And you can see that right here. Now when we divide the extracellular compartment up, we get into the plasma volume, which is 5% of that total 20. And then you get into the interstitial volume and that's 15%. And the constituent of each of those that's important is not so much an electrolyte, but it's albumin. So in the plasma where we measure albumin, we know that its concentration is about four milligrams per deciliter. When we look at the interstitial volume, we know that it's much less than that. It's about one milligram per deciliter. All right, so those are the, to those are the percentages. So total body water, 60%. That 60 is broken down into 40% intracellular, 20% extracellular. That extracellular is broken down into 15% interstitial, 5% plasma. Different fluids have a different volume of distribution. So when you give a particular fluid, it is going to spread out into a particular volume, okay? Now, let's take total body water. So that's 60% of our total weight. What fluid distributes across that entire space? So that's D5 water. So if you give D5 water, that's gonna distribute over the total body water compartment. And so let's take the next volume. So that would be our extracellular volume. That's 20% of our total body weight. And what fluid distributes over that? And so that's gonna be normal saline. So normal saline is isotonic to our extracellular volume. So it's gonna distribute over that compartment. And lastly, let's take our plasma volume. So what's gonna distribute over our plasma volume? So that's gonna be 5% uh, albumin. So when you give 5% albumin, Instead of distributing over all of total body water, it's gonna stay within our plasma volume or 5% of our total body weight. And this is gonna give you an idea and we're gonna do a clinical scenario um, where when a patient comes in with blood loss and you choose a particular fluid to give that patient, how much fluid are you gonna to have to give to replace that blood loss? So let's get into that. So let's say that you have a 60 year old male large volume hematemesis and a history of esophageal varices. You're estimating that he's lost about a liter of blood as he's in stage two shock. So to replace this blood loss, how much D5 water would you have to give versus normal saline versus 5% albumin? So put the pause button on, go ahead, see if you can calculate this out and think about how much of each of these fluids they're gonna need to replace that one liter of blood. Okay, so in order to find out the volume that you have to give, we can do a pretty simple calculation. So that's the volume infused is equal to the expected compartment increment divided by the normal compartment volume multiplied by the volume of distribution for that particular fluid. And so we can go through this for each of them and then you'll have a really good idea of, of how this works with the fluid that you're giving in the resuscitation bay. So how about for D5W? So our expected compartment volume increment is one liter. We lost a liter of blood and we wanna give a liter. Okay, so we want that to increase by a liter. 
we divide that by the normal compartment volume. So the normal compartment volume of plasma is 5% of 70 kilos, so that's gonna be 3.5 liters. So that's 3.5. Then you multiply that by the volume of distribution of that fluid or 42 liters. So if you want to replace this one liter of blood with D5W, you're gonna to have to give 12 liters. Now you don't wanna do that. Why do you not wanna do that? It's gonna spread over the whole total body water compartment. And so you're gonna put a ton in the interstitial uh, volume and you're, that person's gonna be the Michelin man, all right? So let's go to the next one. How about normal saline? So let's go to the next one. How about normal saline? When we do normal saline, our expected volume increment is again one. We divide this by the normal compartment volume, so 3.5 again, 5% of 70 kilos. We multiply that by the volume of distribution for normal saline, which is the extracellular volume, so that's 14 liters, and we get four liters. So that means if you want a one liter increase in your plasma volume, your blood volume, you're going to want to have to give four liters of normal saline. And so you can say, well, where does that additional three liters go? That's going to go to the interstitial uh, fluid, okay? And that's why all those wrinkles go away when you resuscitate somebody with a ton of normal saline, all right? So now let's look at colloids. So if we take 5% albumin, what's going to happen? So you get one liter divided by 3.5 liters, which is our compartment volume again. You multiply that by the volume of distribution for albumin, 5%, and what do you get? You get one liter. All right, so now there's a whole discussion about what's better for trauma resuscitation, colloids versus crystalloids. We're not gonna get that into that right now. We'll get into that in maybe another talk, but for your understanding, this is how you can determine what volume you need to infuse of what fluid and where that fluid is gonna go. I'm gonna pop over here for a second, and uh, now we can talk about what are obligatory fluid losses. So if you don't do anything, how much fluid are you just gonna lose and how much fluid are you gonna to have to replace? So this is your daily need of fluid and electrolytes. So first, you gotta make urine. Now, no matter what, you're still gonna pee. And your normal urine uh, production is gonna be about a half a mil per kilo per hour to a mil per kilo per hour. Now, if we look at our GI losses, and we'll go into each of these organs and how much fluid they're actually producing, but the majority of gastrointestinal secretions are reabsorbed. And so you're really only losing about 100 to 200 milliliters of fluid for our GI losses. And then we have our insensible losses. And so that's eight to 12 mils per kilo per day. And this is gonna change, so it's gonna change based on temperature. So as our temperature goes up, our insensible losses are gonna go up. In addition, when we shorten the airway, so for instance, if we put a tracheostomy in, we're gonna have more insensible fluid loss because we're, we're losing some surface area of reabsorption. And so now if we wanna replace fluid, how do we do that? Now in the fluid and energy uh, video, go ahead, check that out, click up there. Um, we talked about maintenance fluid requirements in the 421 rule. So that's four mils per kilo uh, per hour for the first 10 kilos, two mils per kilo per hour for the second 10 kilos, one mil per kilo per hour for every kilo after that. You can also, take this and go for mils per kilo per day, if you wanna think about 24 hour period, and that would be 100 mils per kilo for the first 10, 50 mils per kilo for the second 10, and then 20 mils per kilo for uh, every kilo after that. And so if we want to kind of put together these uh, estimates, so why does maintenance fluid, why does the 421 rule work? Well, let's just take an example, and if we um, take some average uh, numbers here. So let's take our urine losses. So let's say we have 0.75 mils per kilo. That's going to be 1,260 mils. Uh, if we take our gastrointestinal losses, that's going to be 200. Add to this some insensible losses. Let's say that's it's hot outside. We're in Las Vegas here. 12 mils per kilo per day. That puts us right about 2,300 milliliters. And so if you do the 421 rule for a 70 kilo person, that's 2,440. So you can see that it basically will approximate your obligatory fluid losses, and this is why this works for determining our maintenance fluid requirement. Another thing we wanna ask ourselves is how about electrolyte losses? And so we have some obligatory electrolyte losses, 
And uh, for sodium, that's about 100 to 250 milliequivalents per day. And for potassium, it's about 15 to 20 milliequivalents per day. And then just to throw up here, when you're looking at the amount needed of different electrolytes, we can say that sodium, and we talked about this in the TPN lecture, it's about one to two milliequivalents uh, per kilo uh, per day. And then uh, potassium is 0.5 to one milliequivalents per kilo per day. For the other electrolytes, while their replacement is important when you're thinking about TPN, usually we don't have to think about uh, replacing those, but we do want to keep an eye on both sodium and potassium. And so what maintenance fluid do you choose? We got a, a few to pick from, and I put a table up here, and this is out of uh, Norton's, you can review it, um, but it's really important to understand which fluids have how much of what electrolytes, and I always like to ask the residents, medical students, oh, you wanted to give lactated ringers, why did you want to give that? You know, so how much sodium is in that? And why is that important? Well, it's important because, let's say you're in the trauma bay and you're dealing with a TBI patient, and you're gonna give bolus them LR. Well, you don't want to do that because you're bolusing them with fluid that's low in sodium and that may worsen their cerebral edema. So you want to stay away from those, you know, relatively hyponatremic um, fluids when you're resuscitating a trauma patient with a TBI. So you have to know these fluids and what's in them. And I put all the, those numbers up here. This will also give you um, some good like knowledge armamentarium so that if you have an NG tube in and we're going to talk about it and you're sucking out gastric fluid, what do you replace that with? If you have an ostomy and you're dumping out, you know, um, small bowel effluent, what do you replace that with? If you have a patient with a lot of diarrhea, what do you replace that with? How about a pancreatic fistula? What do you replace that with? And so we'll go through uh, each of those kind of uh, organ contents, but knowing what your fluids are and what their electrolyte compositions are gonna give you an idea of what fluid you can replace those losses with. Another important thing to think about is we think about our maintenance fluid, but you also, when you're doing perioperative fluid replacement, there are other things to take in consideration. And our anesthesia colleagues do an awesome job at this, um, but it's important to consider blood loss. You also are gonna have extravascular fluid sequestration. So in when you're doing an open hernia repair, this is gonna be low, maybe four mils per kilo per hour, but when you're doing an open, open aorta, it's gonna be double that, okay? So that, that edema is really going to be increasing those bigger operations. You also got to think about the drains that you're placing as well as GI losses. So that could be both from nasogastric output or ostomy loss. Finally, up here, I just wanted to put in the different volumes secreted by the different organs in the GI tract. You know, the stomach has a great range, 1,000 to 4,200 milliliters. And you can see that if we didn't reabsorb this, we would turn into a prune in like a couple of hours. But fortunately, reabsor we reabsorb most of this content. Uh, and so that's why our GI losses are so low. In each of these, if you look at what is gonna be the best replacement fluid for a particular uh, organ. So let's say that we have a nasogastric tube in and we're sucking out stomach fluid. Well, it's high in sodium and it's high in chloride and you're gonna to wanna to replace this with you know, um, normal saline, all right? Now, if you take another fluid loss that is much lower in, um, in chloride, so let's say you have a pancreatic fistula, you know, this is gonna probably be best replaced with something closer to uh, lactated ringers. But you can look at each of these and think about, okay, this is the loss that I have. How do I replace it? This could be a good reference for you again out of Norton's. All right, so I hope that was a, a good review of the different fluid compartments, the different fluids that we utilize in the perioperative period, how you give those, how much to give, and what their electrolyte composition is. And now we're gonna jump into specific electrolyte disturbances. Dense topic, a lot of information, but you can watch this, you can review it again. I'm also gonna have a review sheet available. You can check that out at citizensurgeon.com. There's a lot of good resources there, totally freely available, so check that out. If you haven't had a chance to subscribe, hit the subscribe button. Also engage, leave some questions and comments. What are some topics that you wanna hear? 
and then I will totally get back to you. So as we close, definitely check out the videos on surgical nutrition and definitely subscribe to Citizen Surgeon YouTube videos. You'll know when each of these videos are coming out. All right, peace out. Thanks so much for joining us.